Heavenly Father, we think of that word, hallelujah, and we can't really, we can't really define it. A term of anxious anticipation or exuberant joy, just something that, something they would shout, and because they would, something that we would shout when we don't know what else to say. So Father, this morning, we want to exclaim to you, we want to pronounce, we want to cry out to a holy God who came looking for us. So this morning, Father, may you change us. May you touch our hearts. May you soften our hearts. Father, allow us to see with your eyes, to love with your heart, and to move with your hands. In Christ's name, amen. Well, amen. It's good to see you this morning. We want to take our Bibles, and we would like for you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And uh, this is a very uh, familiar story. There, I, I knew I hadn't gotten shorter, <laughs> you know. But anyway, very familiar story, Christmas story. And I hope uh, this morning that we can take this very familiar Christians, Christmas story and give you some new insight to it. And the idea here this morning is that it's difficult sometimes to trust the Lord. It's the grace to trust. We've been in a series of messages on Christmas grace. And so understanding this morning, I understand where you are. I understand that it's easy to trust people. It's easy to trust God when you're young. But then you, something happens to your life. You, you experience life. And you experience life and you think to yourself, I can't trust these people anymore. Maybe I can't trust anybody anymore. And sometimes, in fact, most of the time, that bleeds over into our belief and our trust in God. James, in chapter 1, understood exactly what we go through when he says, but he must, meaning us, ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Do you feel that way sometimes, between doubt and faith? For that ought not to expect, that person shouldn't expect anything, to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded, unstable in his ways. Well, as we look at this, I remind you of the book that I did write and I just refer to it, is that uh, overcoming spiritual vertigo because physical vertigo, again, is something where your eyes can't process uh, what, or rather your mind can't process what your eyes are seeing. That's why you get dizzy and disoriented. Spiritual vertigo is a spiritual condition where your faith can't process what you see, hear, or experience. So you experience life and you think, God, how can I trust you in that? Because I prayed for this and I wanted this and I, 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 I uh, just implored you to give me this and it just didn't come. Or I had to wait and wait and wait and maybe I gave up too early, I don't know. I don't understand all this stuff about the Christian life. And so help me out a little bit. Well, we can find some real nuggets in this story. And Joseph's struggle is like our struggle in many, many ways. And so as we look at this this morning, I want us to see a couple of things. First of all, I want us to see the struggles that we face, uh, three of those. And then secondly, the support we find, three insights where we can trust God. All right, first of all, the struggles that we face. Look with me in chapter 1 and verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Well, many of you can understand and appreciate this story, what is going on. But first, I want us to see that the first barrier and the real barrier to us trusting the Lord with the things of our life is a foundational thing. And that is, can we really trust God with our life? Not just the things of our life, not just family, praying for the prodigal son, not just finances, not just our career, not just our marriage, but can we really trust God or have we really trusted God living our life for him? And that's a very foundational principle. It's like trying to build a house without a foundation if you're just trusting God for the things and not trusting God with your life. Because if you're not trusting with your life, you're not going to be able to trust him for the things. You're just not. Because one's very foundational and everything else is growing out like a tree from that found, those foundational roots. 
And so as we're looking at this, one of the reasons why we have a difficult time with giving our life to Christ and really trusting Him with our life and declaring it to be so is the disdain of the world. And certainly the pressure from culture was something that Joseph was experiencing. As we look at this, we understand that in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it says that the woman caught in adultery will be, will be killed. And so she's going to be executed because she broke the law. Now, Roman government came in, the Roman government came in and said the only way that you can execute anybody for any reason is that we give you permission. That's the reason why the Jewish leaders sent Jesus to Pilate in order to be tried because they couldn't kill him on their own. And so that was the law, but it still happened sometime. It still happened occasionally that someone would be killed. So here's the problem that you have. All right, first, you have someone coming to you, your fiance, and she tells you that she is pregnant. Well, you know it's not yours. And he says, what's going on? He's just stunned. And she says, relax, I'm still a virgin. I am with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, are you going to, is that, does that fit your grid? What are you going to say to that? And that's, you can understand where Joseph's coming from. That just didn't fit the grid. That just, he didn't understand how something like that could possibly happen. And she would expect him to believe such a thing. And so he's struggling. And he's struggling with what the world is going to think. If he marries her, He loves her, but if he marries her, he's condemned just like she is. In other words, condemned out of the uh, Jewish faith and and out of the synagogue and the temple worship, ostracized from the community. So he thinks, well, I don't want to do that. And he he thinks, well, if I just give up on her, they're going to persecute her right now if I tell on her. But he knows deep down he's in a dilemma in which even if he waits, all he's doing is putting off her punishment putting off the, 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 the persecution because the world would never understand anything like this as being something spiritual and something of God. Well, we understand in our culture today that the world just simply doesn't understand where we're coming from in the Christian life. They just don't. They don't. I mean, if you are going to pick out any plan of salvation, as we call it, the biblical plan of salvation, you would not pick out the one we have. You see, every other religion of the world, if you study it, has something to do with saying, okay, if, if they do believe in a God, uh, a personal God, they, they would say, you have to please God by working. You've got to work, 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 work. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to live a good life. All makes sense. Hey, if the good outweighs the bad, I guess I'm going to go to heaven. Makes all the sense in the world. But for someone to come along and says, nope, that's not right. This is going to be one religion that says... Everything in the faith has to do with something Jesus Christ has already done for you. And all you have to do is repent of your sins, ask Jesus to come into your heart, and start living for him. It just doesn't make any sense. And so the world looks at us in that way, but it goes beyond that. Suppose you're working at your job and, and you, uh, you're asked to do something unethical. Maybe not illegal, but something that's just not right. And you think, oh, well, I just can't do that. I'm going to have to tell the boss I can't do that. Everybody's doing it. And your friend says, everybody's doing that. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Are you going to to risk your job and get fired for not doing this? Doesn't make No, no, my Christian faith. What do you mean you're Christian? Look, God wants you to prosper, doesn't he? Doesn't he want you to be blessed? Do you think he wants you to be on the unemployment line? See, it doesn't fit the grid. It doesn't make sense. I remember being at, uh, in college, the University of Georgia, um, you don't have to, I mean, red and black. I mean, there's Christmas colors too, you know? But anyway, I was there, and I was in this class as a freshman. And these guys were uh, discussing the blue laws of Athens. And I'm sure they're not there now, but back then they had just voted to confer- reconfirm the blue laws, meaning you can't open up certain businesses on Sunday, besides a few service stations, you know, and things like that. And so this guy was saying, does that mean I can't go to the Kmart on Sunday? Man, that doesn't make any sense. And somebody says, these people are stupid. I don't think they understood what the law meant. I think when they voted, they didn't know what they were voting for. You see, it didn't fit the grid. They just, they didn't get it. They they could not possibly understand it. And so for you and I to declare our faith, 
for you and I to take stands, you might say, on ethical things in our life, for you and I to declare ourselves a believer, we have to suffer the disdain of the world. When we say spiritual stuff like, well, I'm, I'm really, I mean sincerely, not just being spiritual but, or, or pious, but somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm really praying about this. I'm, what are you mean, praying? Man, you got to do something. You get the disdain and the misunderstanding of the rest of the world. And really, in order to become a Christian, you've got to be willing to risk that. You've got to be willing to do it. And this was what was happening in his life. It's sort of like a spiritual shyness that comes over people. You know, I don't want to do too much here. I don't want to trust too much because look what has happened to me when I've stepped out. Look what happens to me when I take a stand and really stand alone for God. Boy, I get persecuted. I don't want that kind of life anymore. Secondly, we see something else happening here, and that is the, there's a perspective here of experience. Normal people don't get impregnated by the Holy Spirit. You can see that Joseph, her husband, he said betrothed, he said she was with child of the Holy Spirit in verse 18. He planned to send her away because, my goodness, this, just, this doesn't fit. And you and I know that as believers, we go through this experience thing all the time. We pray about something. Maybe as a very young believer, we pray and pray. We think, well, God's going to do something. And he, and he didn't. Or he didn't do it the way we wanted it to be done. And so now we're experiencing that, that spiritual vertigo in which we want to believe the Bible, but it, it's just not you know, I want to believe the Bible, but I've experienced too much type of stuff. And so what's happened? If you can just imagine yourself like, it's in a, like in a jail cell, and there's walls and a roof all around you, and you, there's no windows, and somebody comes in every day and says, hey, look, there's really hope. There's beautiful flowers on the outside. There's a creek running along the place. It's just a great place. One day you're going to walk out of here and see this beautiful scenery all the way around you. And time after time this is told to you, and you're waiting and waiting, and pretty soon you just sort of give up. This guy's lying to me. I mean, it just can't be true. This is just life right here in this box. This is what life's all about. There's nothing outside this box. There's nothing. And we lose hope. You've heard the stories of POWs that have been caught in World War II and Vietnam War and, and so forth. They, they say that they, they were tortured for being an American soldier. And they were in captivity. But one of the biggest, time and time and time again, the thing that I hear more, more out of, of all the people, they would say, the biggest torture at all was when they sit, that set you down and said, your country has forgotten about you. That was so hard to take. Nobody wants you anymore. Nobody values you anymore. You were caught. It's been months. They've done nothing to negotiate for you. Nothing. You're just here with us forever and your country hates you, and you might as well tell us what you know, and then we'll make life good for you. Over and over and over again, they hear that. And it's only the faithful that would say, no, I, I do have a hope. I do have a hope that something's happening there, that people do value me, that do, they do care about me. Now, what's our problem? Here it is, and, and it's more prevalent here probably in our American society than it is most. And that is... We tend, because we're Americans and have so many good things, and we, we watch television, we see the movies, we, oh, Facebook, man, everybody's life on Facebook is marvelous, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that? I mean, it's great. Well, I wish I were there having a great time. And as soon as maybe they snap the picture, they start uh, duking it out. I don't know, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just false. I mean, nobody, nobody lives on vacation all the time. But you look at that and you think, that's what I expect. That's what I expect. And so we become critical. This isn't working in my life. This isn't working in my life. I'm, I'm critical of the government. I'm critical of the church. I'm critical of my family. I'm I don't want to go there for Christmas. Man, I, I don't want to hang around that guy in my family. And over and over and over again, we, we just become critical. Whether you're going to school, you're critical of the lunchroom food. You're critical of the classroom. You're clear, uh, critical of maybe of the teacher. And and so we look, we have a tendency then to look at what we don't have rather than to what we do have. And that criticism bleeds over to God. God, I really expect you to give me this, 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 and this, and this, and to serve me. And you haven't served me the way I want to be served. And so, God, I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering how in the world can I believe you if you just won't give me what I want? What's the cure for that? The beginning cure is to balance the scales. How do you do that? 
you become not critical, but you become thankful. Every time you think about something critical you don't have, you look over here and say, God, look at what you've blessed me with. God, I, I'm saved. Boy, I, I could be a person that's without God, cast out forever, but God, you have saved me. God, you've given me these family members that are really, really great. God, you've given me this kind of job. God, you've provided for me. You've put me in a place of being in the most prosperous, greatest country in the world. There's all kinds of stuff. If you were to train yourself, and all of a sudden now the scales are balanced. As a matter of fact, they're more than balanced, and, and I'm not critical anymore. I'm thankful, and now I can look and say, God, you know, if you've done this, you can do this. And now our faith begins to increase, and we're not going through that spiritual vertigo and that spiritual shyness anymore, but we, we see the experience in connecting the dots to our faith. And you say, well, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. Listen, it's the times that we go through stuff that we, that we draw closer to God. You think the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph six weeks before, two months before, six months before, a year before? No, he appeared to him at his darkest time. That's when we get to know God. Philip Yancey has said it best when he says, the mystery, mystery is not the absence of meaning, but the presence of more meaning than we can comprehend. God has something going on in our life. Now, the third thing is basically the power of lordship. Why, why can't we just simply trust God? Why can't we do that? Because it's difficult, listen to me very carefully, it's difficult to trust God with things when there's no foundation of trust there. Hear me again. I, I, it's hard for me to say, God, I'm trusting you in my finances, and I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to trust you in my finances, but maybe not my family. I'm going to trust you in my family, but maybe not this, maybe not my job. What we're really saying is, God, there's something missing here foundationally. I'm going to trust you with them, but I'm not going to trust you with my life. I'm going to call the shots in my own life. That is a dichotomy of the mind, and we're not, we're not trained. Our mind is not built to think that way. Either you're all in or you're all not. That's it. Either you believe it or you don't. And when we don't believe it, it's difficult over here to, to, to piecemeal these things and to put scriptures together of promises when your foundation of life is just not there. Notice what it's saying here in verse uh, 20. But when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will, shall, shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The Lordship of Christ. The number one, number one reason... No, first of all, let me just say this. This is kind of like a little, little extra insight. But in verse 21, it says, you shall call his name Jesus. Did you know that even in the Bible times, you had a right to name your own children? You have a right to name your children. You know, grandparents or whatever, try to, you know, throw out a name. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that one in mind. But you basically get together as a couple, and you may agree on something right away. It may take you a while to agree on something, but you have a right to name that child because they're under your authority. What God was saying to Joseph, I'm going to name this child. You have no authority to name this child because this child's not under your authority. He's under my authority. And one day he's going to be under your, you're going to be under rather his authority. There's an insight there to the Lordship of Christ. The number one reason why people do not receive Christ is that they're going to have to give the rulership of their life over to God. That foundational thing. God, I trust you with my life. You say, man, that, that does not fit the grid. And think about it for just a moment. How many, how many churches, how many religions of the world that say, if you pray this many times, or you do this ritual over here, you do that, and you go to church, and you give a little money, if you just do these things, do these things, you're going to be okay. And so many of those people would say, well, yeah, I can do that. Sure. Give a little here, do a little here. I, I can do all that. No problem. And they still have a moral code, a moral code that they can live with themselves. And so they live by the moral code, and they do all these little rituals, and the pastor or whatever priest will tell them they're okay. I can do that. But then you get down to the real gospel. Say, so here it is. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose again on the third day. 
And those who follow Christ must confess him not only as Savior, but Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10, you repent of your sins, you receive Christ into your heart. And therefore, because of the life change, he's going to become Lord of your life. He said, now, wait a minute. Hmm, give up the rulership of my life? You know, you can forget that one. That's why easy believism has come, become so popular. Hey, just pray this prayer, get a little baptized, get a little water thrown on you or, or dunked. In fact, you can do it five or six different ways just to cover your bases. All those things have become very acceptable because it doesn't have any surrender of your life over to the Lord. And we live as though, then, God's kind of got to do something for us. We're doing something for God. We're going to church. We're giving money. We're doing a little something. So, God, you've got to serve us. Now, there's my finances over here, and I, you know, I need a job. I need a better job. I, know I need you to get involved in that. And, he, and, and no job comes. And you think, well, man, what is that all about? Again, the foundation is not there. You're trying to build a house without the foundational principles of life. And you say, well, if I give my heart to God, what guarantees do I have that things are going to work out? Well, there's a verse in the Bible. It's not going to be up on your screen. I'm just going to quote it to you best I can, Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So if I give my heart to God, if I, and it's more, let me define that. What I mean is I'm trusting God with my life, my whole life. I just, I trust you. Tell me what to do. I'll do that. And I trust you to bless my life and to take care of me. That's what I'm doing. And once I do that, then these things over here become very natural. I don't have to have a, a, a split mind, a divided, a double mind, and say, I don't trust you in my life, but let me trust you in my finances. I don't trust you in my life, but let me trust you in my son or daughter. No, I'm trusting you, God, with my whole life. And so how do you do that? Well, it gives us some support here in the Scriptures. There's three things I want us to see. First of all, God is sovereign enough that we can trust him. Sovereign means God rules. There's nothing surprises him. Now, he gives us all kinds of choices in life. We have career choices. Now, I believe there's a plan for your life, but you don't have to receive it. There's marriage. I believe, some people don't believe this. There's one person that God wants to, to match you up with. You know, it's, it's, it's match, you know, heavenlymatch.com, you know, whatever. But... But you may not marry that person. So there's choices. There's choices in our salvation as well. God draws you with his spirit. God gives you the faith that you need. And it's up to us as good soil, as the parable of the soils, to receive the, the word of God and make a decision for him. And God in his sovereignty is, is secure with all that. He can put every, all the pieces of the puzzle, no matter what happens, because he knows in advance what's going to happen. He can put all those things together. And there you have it. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end of the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God is sovereign enough. How, how important is that? One of the things we find here, it says, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, verse 20. We're afraid. Why don't we give our heart to God we're, to a point where we trust him without, we're afraid God if I give up control I don't have control and we do all kinds of things in life even as Christians to gain control we just why because we want the security some people want the power but other people just want the security you know if I just control and manipulate things if I if I do something very you know be a persuasive person I can control my life and it's difficult to say, God, I'm going to let you control my life. But security means that a responsible person cares about me. And who's more responsible to God than God? Who, who can rule more than God? God is the ruler. But then I want you to notice that God is powerful enough. Now, when you and I think about two things, we think about two things before we trust anybody, including God. Will, can he? Can he do it? Will he do it? The can he do it has to do with God's sovereignty and God's power. Jesus was born of a virgin. Look in verse 22. It says, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This shows his sovereignty. Verse 23, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's a title from the Old Testament. This is quoting Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. The translated means God with us. He'd be born of a virgin. And it says that in Luke 34 and 35. He's born of a virgin. You say, you believe that? That's kind of off the grid, isn't it? I mean, can you really, I mean, pastor, let me ask you something. If somebody in our church came to you and said, some teenage girl maybe, she says, pastor, I'm pregnant. I said, really? She says, yeah, but hey, relax. That's, the good news is it's of the Holy Spirit. Would you believe that? You know, pastors are asked that kind of stuff. Would you really believe it if somebody came to you? And I love what this one pastor said. I don't know who it was. I'm, I'm just quoting him. But here's what he said when he was asked that question. He said, I would believe it. If an angel visited her boyfriend and said, do not be afraid to take this woman as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. I would believe it. If when that baby was born, wise men traveled from afar and brought gifts to worship him, and a star guided them to where the baby lay. I would believe it if her son had power over the wind and the waves, over death and disease. I would believe it if her son died on a cross and was raised on three days later. I would believe it if that son went out to a mountaintop and ascended visibly back into heaven while an angel stood by and said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. Yes, I would believe that 2,000 years had passed and his followers were numbered in the billions. Yes, I would believe it. If that son led others to discover a new world whose influence built the greatest, the most free, the most missionary sending country in history, a nation that was built on the courage of the cross, on the morals and ethical ethics of the Bible, whose heart and soul was founded upon the love of God, I would believe it. Yes, if that son would rock my world, change my life, give me peace, hope, joy, and love in my life, then I would believe that young lady when she told me she was pregnant with the, with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Now, if, do you believe that? Do you believe that? This points to the fact that can he? Does he have the power to provide my personal needs? Does he have the power to mend a broken heart? Does he have the power to mend a fractured family, to bring home a prodigal, to conquer our fears, to replace sorrow with joy? And the answer is yes. He does have that power. So the question remains, will he? Does he love you enough? I want you to notice that God is loving enough. He says in verse 21, shall bear a son for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he lived 33 and a half years and he died upon a Roman cross and the blood that came down from his brow and his hands and his feet was a payment for your sins and mine. How much does he love you? God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Separated from God, Christ died for us. One professor walks into a classroom and puts two numbers on the board, a four and a two. That's all. And he says, now what's the answer? What's the solution? And somebody said, well, six. Professor said nothing. He just stood there. Like, well, you haven't come up with it yet. And somebody else says, well, that means eight. Four times two is eight. Somebody else said, well, it's two then. If it's not that, it's got to be two. Four divided by two is two. And, he's, and the professor interrupted after some argument that went on. And he said, now the problem is this. You don't know what the problem is. You can't find a solution until you know what the problem is. Is there a plus sign in between these two numbers? Is there a times, an X marking the time? Is there a division mark? What is the problem? And we need to understand this morning, the problem is, is that we've sinned against God. Sin entered into the world by a man by the name of Adam. We've in sin, in, inherited his sin nature. We're responsible for the sins that we do. And Jesus Christ came as a Savior and died on the cross to take our place there on the cross so we can have life and have forgiveness of sin. That's the gospel. 
That is what he's loving enough to do. And he's loving enough to do that. What else is he loving enough to do? You know, the, the, the irony to this whole passage is that Joseph, in fact, look down verse 24. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary to his wife. He kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Basically, God was saying, look, Joseph, you, you obey me and I'll bless you. And God did bless him. Magi came to visit him. Gave them all kinds of gold and frankincense and myrrh. You know the story there. And they had enough money to go to Egypt to run from Herod. And enough to come back and live in that holy place. So prophecy would be fulfilled and he could come through Israel, Jerusalem. God provided every step of the way. And the irony to the whole thing is Joseph had to marry Mary in order to save her life. But Joseph had to marry Mary in order for Mary to save his soul through the Son, Jesus Christ. Kind of a little irony there. So as we look, what is God willing to do? Romans 8.32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Listen, God's still giving. God is a giving God. And he's still giving. All we do is put ourselves under, under his lordship. We're thankful. We follow him and we trust him with our life. Therefore, we can trust him with the other things. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, if that's the prayer of your heart, if you would like to receive Christ into your heart as Savior, And Lord, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud. The prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying there for my sins. I open up the door of my heart and I ask you to come in. I pray that you forgive me of everything that I've done. I trust you with my heart and my soul and my life. In Jesus' name.